Hello, I get to follow what's been described as the best panel of the conference, in the words of my people, oi. But I'm going to do my best. I'm here to introduce you to Dr. Alexander Taylor. Dr. Taylor is the Chief Data Office of Officer of Cambridge Analytica. Now, can I see by a show of hands how many people in this room have read about Cambridge Analytica in the last probably 30 days? All right, well, so you all think you know all about it. Dr. Taylor is here, and we're going to dispel a few rumors before they fester into fact. To begin with, so, uh, Alex, I am a overweight, um, uh, unemployed, white male from a working class background who went to work out of high school. You would think I was a Donald Trump voter. <laughs> it turned out I vote for, voted for Bernie Sanders, but only you know, based on my social media, based on what data you have about me, the likelihood that I was going to vote at all, no less what my voting proclivities would be. How do you, what is that secret science? How do you come about knowing that about me? Sure. Uh, so there's really two components to it. The first is, actually nothing to do with psychology or psychographics at all. The, the first thing that we do as a company is big data analytics, predictive analytics, machine learning. This involves taking large-scale uh, political polling, large-scale market research, marrying that together with all of the individually resolved data that's available about everyone in America at an individual level. This is stuff that you can go and buy off the shelf from companies like Axiom and Experian. And then using machine learning to predict, again, at an individual level, how likely people are to vote, which way they're likely to vote, which social and political issues they care about. The second thing that we do as a company is uh, behavioral sciences research and uh, using uh, that behavioral sciences research to help make our clients creative, more engaging for the target audiences. So in answer to your question, how would we know how likely you are to vote? That really comes from the first bit. It's from the uh, the training set that we build up through large-scale surveys, married together with thousands of consumer lifestyle demographic data points, which are, are freely available about you. Now, I'm going to go back. Dominic is a wonderful moderator. And I'm going to go back to Dominic's first question to the ladies who just left. A year ago, did you imagine that you'd be sitting here talking about the Trump campaign's success in the presidential election and your role in it? And how did that come about? So a, a year ago, we were working with uh, Cruz for president. Um, the, the nature of the electorate was starting to take shape, and it was starting to look like he was a serious contender. Uh, at that point, it still seemed a, a remote chance, and it's really something that uh, gathered a lot of momentum over the last 12 months, and especially in the lead up to election day itself. In terms of how we came to be here, um, as I said, we, we were working with Cruz for president. Actually, we cold called uh, Trump for America at that time, and they said they didn't want to talk to us because we were working for another primary candidate. Uh, and then after Donald Trump's team uh, won the, the primary election, I think they realized suddenly that now they had to run a presidential election. When we started working for Trump for America in June, there was probably less than 30 people working for his campaign. They made very little investment into data or science or modern advertising technology. And all of a sudden, they found themselves confronted with Hillary Clinton's 300-person war machine. Uh, and, and that made us a, a very appealing partner for them, because we did have a lot of technology that we were able to deploy off the shelf, because we had spent the last 12 months working for Ted Cruz, building up that bank of resources. So we got talking to them again and, and closed the contract. Now, if it weren't for 80,000 votes at, out of over 100 million, over 120 million votes, if it weren't for 80,000 votes in three states, we would be sitting here and talking to Evan Krieger, who was the head of Hillary Clinton's data initiatives. Hillary Clinton had 55 graduate level mathematicians working in her office is doing some version of what you were doing. And we would be talking to you on the panel as the guy who lost the cruise race. Now, 
what do you, at what point did you, I mean, let's, apart from talking about the one you won, let's go back to the Cruz race. Now, Cruz didn't make it, uh, uh, didn't win the primaries. Did you see that coming? What did you see in the data that told you that Cruz wasn't going to be able to go all the way? So, uh, throughout the primary cycle, Donald Trump owned the own media space. He, he got, without doing sophisticated ad targeting, without spending millions and millions of dollars on paid media, he got, he was on every TV station every day. Uh, and he turned out a, a previously untapped into proportion of, of US primary voters. Um, that's something that a, a lot of people don't really appreciate about the primary system in the United States. It's only actually a couple of percentage of the population who participate in it. So that Donald Trump can go out and can motivate 40,000 new first time voters in Iowa. That's enough for him to, uh, to succeed in a state like that. It's very different to a presidential where something like 70% of the population is voting in every race anyway. But the sorts of things that we saw that, that showed that uh, the, the tide had turned against Cruz was once those early primary states started ticking over and then we could see that the voting electorate was unlike what it had been in previous years. That's when it really started to look like something unexpected might happen. Now, it, taking the temperature at the election, which one could do every day, especially in social media. Um, that, of course, is somewhat limited because it depends on what your friends are posting and who your friends are. But let's just say my impression was in my social circle that a week before, even the Trump people didn't think Trump would win. Now, in talking about the Trump people, they're probably talking about his close staffers and his press people. A week before the election, just looking at the data, could you have predicted the possibility of his winning? So, uh, I'd start off by saying that there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the idea of sampling a, a representative selection of the population uh, and then using that as a gauge to see what, what the rest of the populace is thinking about. The difficulty is that there's all sorts of biases that creep in and those biases are difficult to correct for. One of the biases you have to correct for is weighting your poll so that it's proportionate to how many people from different demographic and socioeconomic buckets are going to turn out and vote. That's what the, made it so difficult to, to gauge the results of this election properly because there was no way of really knowing until the, the early and absentee votes started coming in uh, that the rural vote was going to be so much increased and the African-American vote was going to be so much decreased. But I gather you and knew that a week before. At that point, yeah, we would reweight the polls and we could see that this is going to look very, very different. Um, and at that point, our advice to the campaign was, if you can take Florida, you have a better than even chance of, of winning the presidency. So it, it really was sunk and lost in Florida. It's a hugely important state from an electoral college point of view. Um, he'd already upset had an upset in the state during the primary cycle when he defeated Marco Rubio on his home turf. And then so the only time when you started really to gain confidence this was going to happen was on election night as the results for Florida started to come in. So this science is pretty powerful stuff. And if you read the DOS magazine piece, which admittedly I had to have translated, um, it was invented by this guy Kaczynski and you guys stole it and you're making all kinds of money with it. Now, if, the more I've looked into this leading up to this panel, I first started reading about the so-called five traits in papers, uh, peer review papers going back to the early 90s. So what is the story of where this science comes from, how it ends up with you all as practitioners and apparently quite excellent practitioners of this science, and, and what are the intellectual underpinnings of this that makes it something new and different than the old, I think, mainly demographic-driven polling and analysis that campaigns have used for decades. Yeah. Uh, the, the origins of the Big Five started with two American academics, Coster and McRae, who published a paper in 1985 suggesting that any given person's personality can be scored in these five key independent traits. And there's been hundreds of articles published about it over the last few years. If you go to Wikipedia and read about the Big Five, you'll see how far back this body of research goes. That Dust Magazine article, it was quite 
I suppose I'll use the word sensationalist in that it took some ideas which have been actively researched by academic psychologists all over the world and tried to uh, use it as a, a panacea to explain how Donald Trump got elected. The first time I heard the name Kaczynski was when that article was published. We had done some um, research projects with other people in the department he was in at Cambridge, but my opinion is that he's an opportunist who's using this as an excuse to raise his own profile. Um, and actually, what we do with psychological scoring, and, and we do do that sort of research, we will take psychological inventories from the literature and proprietary instruments that we develop ourselves, and we'll go out and we will recruit hundreds of thousands of people to take these surveys, such that that gives us another model to extrapolate out across the electorate, uh, and it's another way of, of segmenting up your audiences. So you're not just talking to people who you believe are persuadable voters about the issue that they care about, but you're also using psychological information to instruct how to construct your creative, so that you will use the tone and the language and the imagery to put an ad in front of people that they're most likely to engage with. And that's really the depth of it. I would say that the psychological scoring is the, the icing on the cake, where the cake, where you get the vast majority of your value, is data science, it's modern uh, ad tech, it's best practice digital marketing, it's all of the things that uh, political campaigns have been increasingly adopting uh, and that big commercial agencies are increasingly adopting that we as a, a data science digital marketing agency do very well. But what we do that makes us unique and different is that little bit extra that does drive more email opens, it does drive more clicks in a, a display advertising campaign. But it's, it's not a, a panacea that can take a, an unelectable candidate and push them into office. It's just not the realistic. One example that is often cited is at the time of the third presidential debate, um, your data was able to give the Trump campaign the opportunity to tweak, I would say, is the, rather than create, tweak 175 excuse me, my lips are dry, 175,000 different versions of a, a digital campaign persuading people that, I guess, Donald Trump was going to win this third debate, was the guy that came away the winner. How do you, how do, you do that? How, what is, in fact, the connection between your data and some number? Is it 175,000? Is that even possible? It's, it's tens of thousands, but actually that comes through from the, the cake rather than the icing. Those hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of combinations of, of creative against audience segments come through from the fact that you can dynamically optimize your creative and dynamically optimize who you're serving ads to such that you're maximizing the ROI from your marketing campaign. You're getting your cost per click or your cost per conversion as low as possible in a dynamic way by programmatically altering who you're serving which message and changing the advert slightly. That's different to using psychology to target your creative. That, uh, that component of it comes in further upstream where it's really about creating the, the seed audience segments and the, the seed pieces of creative. And that's certainly not tens of thousands. It's, that's impractical just from a creative point of view. And, and in fact, this is already being done for commercial clients, fast food companies and so forth. It, it's simply what was Remarkable. I mean, as I think back, and, and, and uh, uh, I did work in politics for a while uh, before I was in the media, and uh, my sense is campaigns have always been driven by demographics. So we have to talk to women, so we're going to have to have an opinion on these three key issues. We're going to talk to multicultural audiences, so we have to be able to have these reference points. But you looked out to a room, and that's kind of what you saw, was you saw a very rough demographic profile. At this point, you are that targeting um, is a science that's being used by marketers to sell hamburgers. It's just that this year it worked its way into the political campaigns in a significant way, frankly, for which you guys are given a lot of credit. Yeah, so uh, a lot of commercial agencies, demographic targeting has largely been uh, not so placed but um, extended through the use of large scale consumer and lifestyle data, which is readily available. It's, it's people's online browsing habits, it's point of sale data, it's, it's 
all sorts of things. What we do, which is different and unique, and we do this in the commercial space as well as in political, is that we offer an alternative way of segmenting up a group of uh, a target audience such that we can serve ads to extroverts independent of introverts. So we're not sort of dividing up an audience along the lines of gender or what you've bought, but along the lines of the, uh, the disposition, the sort of psychological profile of those audiences. And this allows people to be shown pieces of creative that they're more likely to engage with and allows our clients to have a, a higher return on investment on their marketing spend. But that's really the outcome. It's, it's not about being sinister. It's, it's not about tricking people into voting for a candidate who, who they wouldn't otherwise support. It's just about making marketing on the other more hand, efficient. To begin with, the whole idea that there's somebody with a file on each one of us is scary stuff to begin with. Um, secondly, the, uh, the attitudes, I think it's fair to say, about privacy are different between the U.S., where what you've just done is sort of off-the-shelf stuff, and Europe, where I think there is a more... Uh, there's more of a process, a legal process, around getting access to, to data. The article, I think, focused on the fearful side that what you had done in the state was going to come here, that the science in and of itself, you guys notwithstanding, notwithstanding who the practitioners are, the science in and of itself is and should be scary to let's just say it was written for a European audience. And secondly, that you guys as practitioners, at least to, uh, uh, on the panel before, somebody admitted that there is, Megan I think admitted, there is such a thing as the liberal media, but let's not, let's not even address it as the liberal media, but just simply a kind of group that cares deeply about privacy issues are quite alarmed, not just about the science, but about Cambridge Analytica as a company. So let, here's a two-part question. Sh should the science be considered as a scary science? You yourself live, at least for the next uh, few months in Europe. You live in Britain. Uh, and uh, secondly, you guys have worked for Trump. You had something to do with predicting Brexit. I don't know the, who hired you and the exact details of that. You've got a European elections coming up this year with names that some folks in the room are likely to find scary prospects as future heads of state. Is there anybody you won't work for, is one question. And how do you draw that line? And secondly, apart from you all as the practitioners, should we all be worried about the pervasiveness now of this science that you represent? Okay. So uh, the, the first question, is there anyone that we wouldn't work for? And the answer is yes. Whenever we're talking to a new client, there's always a process that we go through around assessing, are we going to be able to add value to what this client's doing? Uh, is this client a, a business operational or reputational risk to us? Is it a good cultural fit for us and our staff and, uh, and the way that we operate? And if, if we can't answer each of those questions positively and confidently, then we wouldn't take on the contract. In terms of whether this is a, a scary science... But is it a sort of Stepford staff, or is this, does the staff actually have a kind of diversity that goes beyond Trump, Brexit, that is, that's a very, and so It's a very diverse stuff. Uh, I mean, by headcount, we're probably about half American, half European, a lot of people from the continent, and uh, everyone's got very strong political views. It's, these things are always very, very lively debated inside of the organization. So it's the human check and balance of a corporate culture. Yeah, and uh, of course that's always an element to it. At the same time, we are a professional services firm. Uh, it is our job to, to work for our clients and, and do our best for them. Um, but the, the short answer is, uh, of course, we wouldn't work for some clients. We're, and how not... do you address, finally, the question of the genius demon that lives inside the science itself and um, how concerned uh, Europeans should be, how much they should be uh, looking to their government to regulate, looking to you to self-regulate, yeah, so or, or, or is it all a lot of Sturm und Drang around not so much? And the, the regulatory environment in Europe is very different to that in the US. Uh, European data law is all centered on this idea of informed consent. 
for a company or an organization to hold data on a European citizen, they need to have consent to have that data and have it for a specific purpose. That means that a lot of what we've done in America, we couldn't then just go and apply exactly the same methodology in Europe. So what we end up doing is we work more heavily inside of clients' own data sets where they've got the informed consent of people uh, to use the data that those companies have collected for segmentation, for marketing. We'll match it together with market research. We'll use the same underlying transferable skills, but probably on a, a less uh, nationwide scale. It, it is a, a completely different ball game. Okay, so we've used our 20 minutes, but I don't think anyone will be too upset if I ask you one more question, which is what is your favorite Trump campaign anecdote? Because frankly, I, I know nobody who worked, I don't know anyone who worked on the campaign, and I would love to hear a great story. What's the, what did you witness? What did you, what can you share with it? There's, we're all off the record here. It's, uh, <laughs> these are your uh, 200 closest new friends. Uh, I would have to say it's probably, uh, it was probably election night and it was probably just the way um, the, the mood altered in, in New York City, kind of uh, in terms of the atmosphere in the bar we were in once the results started coming in and, and people starting to realize what was really happening. That was quite a striking moment that's going to stay with me for a long time. So you guys were already drinking. You weren't so sure what these numbers were going yeah, to be I, I mean, until then. By the time polls have closed, the, the race is run. All you can do is watch the results come in. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your patience. Uh, Alexander Taylor from Cambridge Analytica. Thank you.